Welcome everyone. My name is Professor Douglas Bourne. I'm Director of Development Education Research Centre, University College London, and Chair of the Academic Network of Global Education and Learning, which is the international network of global education professionals from all around the world. We'd like to welcome you to this webinar and introduce Suzanne, who will be chairing this webinar in a moment. Hello, and a warmly welcome from me from Bamberg University. Uh, in Germany, we all together are very pleased that the Academic Network for Global Education and Learning gives us the opportunity to share our research and discuss our conclusions with you. Our subject is global learning as a dimension of education for democracy. With this thematic focus, we would like to address the question of what global learning can contribute to the promotion of democracy and how it does so. The presentations are based on an understanding of democracy that covers two fundamental aspects. First, there is democracy as a political system. In this perspective, we see democracy as a form of political decision-making and coexistence a process of negotiation between reasonable individual interests and those of the society. Second, this political form needs to be embedded in a democratic culture, following theories of deliberative democracy. In this perspective, democracy is a way of life concerning all societal relations. This involves processes that do not happen by nature. Instead, they require skills, and those skills need to be learned. Our initial hypothesis is that global learning encompasses many facets that make an important contribution to this learning, including both dimensions of democracy, the institutional politics as a democratic culture in the way of life. Today, we will proceed in the following way. Four studies will be presented. Short comprehension questions can be put in the chat and will be answered directly after the presentation. Professor Annette Schoenflug, our discussant, will summarize and comment the presentations afterwards. As last part, we like to discuss with you our results and implications. Our first contribution is presented by Jana Costa. She is a postdoctoral, postdoctoral researcher at the Leibniz Institute for Educational Trajectories, the LIFB in Bamberg in Germany. She focuses on empirical evidence on educational issues in the context of sustainability, learning, and teaching for sustainability and methodological questions. She is combining qualitative and quantitative approaches for research in this complex field. Now, Jana Costa explains which conceptions of citizenship underpin the survey of global competencies in the 2018 PISA survey, this policy agenda set on a global scale. Please, Jana, you have the floor. So thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to open up a scientific perspective on an existing measurement instrument for the assessment of global competencies. As Susanne said, there are many ways of conceptualizing and understanding global competencies. And in the next 10 minutes, I invite you to go deeper into one of these conceptualizations. First, uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about why it is exciting and also important to look more closely at what's actually happening in large scale assessments. So when I talk about large scale assessments, I'm referring to large scale studies that collect information on student performance, often in an international comparison. These studies are particularly interesting because they are often used to inform evidence based policymaking. 
So I'm sure that I won't tell you something new when I'm referring to the fact that there is a progressive shift towards empirical research on education. And that is relevant for all fields of education. Evidence is increasingly becoming um, the basis for rational educational policy and also for practical decisions. And one of the most significant and politically influential studies collecting data on school performance is the Program for International Study Assessment, shortly PISA. As part of this study, various interdisciplinary competencies are regularly surveyed in addition to the classical core areas such as reading. In 2018, this competence was called global competence. And the conceptualization and modeling of this huge construct was quite challenging because of diffuse and messy terms, concepts, and different understandings. At present, there is no clear and really agreed up your, up on view of what global competence is, what it does or does not include, or how it should be measured. Therefore, it's not surprising that the conceptualization as presented by the OECD is quite critically perceived and also commented on in academic discourses. We worked in a research group on the proposed modeling of global competencies, and we tried to analyze the data provided by the OECD so everybody could access these data sets. In this context, it was increasingly clear that the theoretical framework cannot be grasped from simply reading the reports and the framework papers. So we have therefore decided to take a step back and look at the positioning of global competencies in the academic discourse instead of working with the concrete data. This is particularly interesting because global competencies are linked to different strands of research in the scientific discourse. In educational science, the challenges associated with the developments towards a global world society have been discussed in different yet closely interlinked and interrelated fields for decades. Here are some of the different research um, strands in this context. The diversity of approaches indicate that there cannot be a uniform and from everybody accepted competence model. Overall, there are overarching challenges in operationalizing a messy construct and transforming it to a reliable and valid measurement instrument. And each of the presented discourse lines are dealing with that questions. So for a long time. So against this background, the aim of our study is to better understand the theoretical foundation of the competence, competence modeling and to link them back to existing discourses. So we therefore ask on which theoretical foundations is the modeling of global competency space and can discursive vocal points be identified. In the next step, we um, check the links to less represented discourses, but today I will focus on the first question. But before giving you an insight into the methodological approach and the results of our study, I would like to briefly outline on uh, how global competencies are conceptualized by the OECD. In their framework paper, the OCD describes global competencies as the ability to examine local, global, and intercultural issues, understand and appreciate different perspectives and worldviews, interact successfully and respectfully with others, and take responsible action towards sustainability and collective well being. So, a very big claim here. When it comes, uh, so global competencies, uh, they, they um, write further, is necessary to live harmoniously in multicultural communities, to thrive in a changing labor market, use media platforms effectively and responsibly, and support the sustainable development goals. When it comes to the concrete operationalization, they narrow this all these claims down, and that's absolutely necessary for measurement. Without going into detail about the operationalization on the level of individual items, I would like to take a brief look at the basic structure of the survey. 
So different survey methods are used to measure different components in, in, the, in the whole instrument. This means that there is a clear, distinct, a clear distinction has to be made between the classical competence or performance measurements on the one hand, so um, assessing global understanding, knowledge, cognitive skills, and so on, and the self-assessment in form of questionnaires on the other side. And so in uh, the cognitive test, so the, 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 on the left side, was rejected in 81 countries, including Germany. So all the results you can read about these, um, about these uh, uh, different, uh, about global competencies, for, ex for example, in Germany, is just related to the self-reported self knowledge and so on. Hopefully, you now have some idea of how global competencies are conceptualized. However, it is not important that you know all what is covered here on this slide. The purpose of this slide is simply to give you a, a brief insight to the content. But now back to our study. We asked which theoretical discourses are involved in the conceptualization. Our idea is that by looking at the literature references in the framework, we will be able to find out more about the relationship of the global competence framework to existing discourses in academia. So first, we aim to conduct a systematic bibliometric analysis of all literature references in the OECD framework. The bibliometric analysis will allow us to uncover implicit vocal points and their interconnections. The 108 references cited from the OECD Global Competence Framework are our, are our data source. On the right side, you can see a timeline of all the publications that form the basis of our analysis in this context. To uncover the implicit vocal points, we perform a co-occurrence analysis. And we included all terms that appeared in at least two titles or abstracts of all the cited literature. We excluded more formal terms like country or form of publication or filler words, something like that. This resulted in a total of 179 terms. So now let's take a closer look at the results of the analysis. What you can see here is a network of terms mentioned in the titles or abstracts. Larger terms are mentioned more frequently in the publications and smaller terms are mentioned less frequently. The strongest link between the terms are displayed in lines. A total of five clusters indicated by the five different colors was found. The most prominent cluster is probably the green cluster on the right side of the network. It contains terms like reliability, measure, instrument, and many of the terms in the green cluster are related to methodological aspects, so we called it the methodological cluster. The dark blue cluster with its terms like awareness, intercultural sensitivity, intercultural dialogue or cultural diversity can best be described as intercultural cluster. Terms like citizen, citizenship, global citizenship, government, human rights, and also nation state is in the red cluster and they point towards the, this cluster being like a civic cluster. The purple and the red cluster contain a number of terms that point to them being joined, a joint education or educational assessment cluster. Here are terms like higher education, next generation assessment, psychology, education progress, and so on. So this network diagram shows that publications cited in the framework seem to represent certain discourses, while other remain underrepresented. While issues of cultural identity, interculturality, citizenship, and also methodological questions are relatively well presented in the terms, other discourses, such as sustainability issues, are hardly represented. 
Having presented these findings, I would like to relate them back to the academic discourse. What we can see in the OECD model of global competence is that complexity is reduced by focusing on specific aspects, such as intercultural aspects or citizenship issues. And don't get me wrong, it is absolutely necessary to reduce complexity when measuring complex constructs. But with the demands formulated in the framework, it is necessary, necessary to justify the choice transparently. So in the framework, we find a less intense engagement with all issues of global justice, power relations, and also with sustainability. All in all, there is a specific understanding of global globality which emerges and in which complexity is ma massively reduced. So we can see a narrowing down of the discourse, and this is particularly problematic if one takes into account the diversity of discourses and the complex learning challenges in the globalized world society. So if this re reduction of complexity is contrasted with the global learning challenges, it becomes clear that there is a gap or a discrepancy between these demands and the actual co um, conceptualization of the measurement instruments. For example, this is visible in um, relation to contradictions, uncertainties, power structures in global societies. They are hardly addressed in this conceptualization of global competencies. So in conclusion, a number of fundamental questions can be raised to stimulate further reflection on the issue. For example, what are the implications of such assumptions for further political and scientific discourse? Because the, the evidence generated by these um, different data sets is really um, of high potential for um, leading um, policy, um, uh, policy decisions and so on. You could also ask which perspectives are dominant here and which are excluded. And then you are in the um, context of power structures in global discourses. Furthermore, the question arises: what are the aspects that are emphasized by such modeling and which ones are not, are not emphasized? And what does this mean for evidence-based educational policy? A lot of questions, and I hope um, that we will discuss them later in the discussion. And I thank you for your attention. So I would like to proceed directly to our next presentation. And that's uh, Luise Olich, a PhD, PhD candidate at Bamberg University, uh, at Bamberg Graduate School of Social Science. Her empirical work is centered around two topics. First, understanding of democracy education of teachers in Tanzania in reference to partnerships, for example. Second, on subjective theories of political foundations on external promotion of democracy through education, also located in Tanzania. Today, she presents results she worked out together with Eric Msuyai from Tanzania. They both looked closely on the conditions under which school partnerships open up spaces for democracy learning across different learning contexts. Please, Louise, you have the word. Thank you very much for the for the introduction. As my colleague just said, I will uh, today present parts of my study on conditions for learning democracy in North South school partnerships, um, and a specific study that what uh, that I conducted in the context of Tanzania. Um, here you can see uh, the overview of my presentation. Um, very. Usually, I will uh, first introduce into the topic and present my research question. Then I will um, talk about the theoretical framework uh, to which my uh, study relates. Related, um, I will present uh, the method section, specifically give you some information about uh, the Tanzanian context and about the research design. 
Um, and then I, of course, I will present my findings uh, with regard to the topics that were identified um, as potential, um, potentially interesting for mutual learning in uh, the context of North-South school partnerships. This is a very difficult term to <laughs> repeat quite often during the presentation. Um, I try my best. Um, then I will um, talk about the understanding of democracy that might uh, maybe uh, underpin um, the, the responsive, uh, responses of the Tanzanian teachers. I will talk um, finally about the understanding of good citizenship and give uh, some brief uh, ideas about how we can discuss these findings. Um, so uh, in the literature, we find several references putting forward the argument that North South school partnerships um, in general and encounters have a great potential for global learning. But in reality, um, many authors also uh, point out that those might rather reinforce theory types uh, on differences and paternalisms. Therefore, um, different authors also um, uh, argue that the teacher uh, is um, the central factor for the actual sex, uh, success of global learning in the context of North South School Partnerships, and that there needs to be a whole school approach, which means that everyone in the school community is involved in the school partnership. Um, also, in the, this context, we find that there's a lack of research on the perspective of global, uh, of the global southern teachers um, and how they um, see and contribute to the to the partnership. Um, and most studies that um, that are out there um, focus on the northern perspectives. Therefore, um, with my study, I wanted to address the question of uh, what ideas uh, school actors from the global south and in my case from Tanzania have about the potential of global learning in North South. South school partnerships. Um, and what is also um, argued in, in the literature is that there is a global uh, gl great overlap between political education, civic education and global learning. And therefore, especially with regard to today's topic, I will also have a look on the question um, of how uh, or whether or not South school partnerships can support democracy learning. Uh, Theory-wise, I refer to the work of Google, who describes encounters uh, as situated learning opportunities. Um, however, uh, in, the con in this context, also school partnerships can be understood as community of practices, uh, of practice, and um, that they create uh, situations where uh, the everyday life can be experienced in its differences and therefore promote uh, learning processes. On the other hand, in the literature, we have another great part that deals uh, with uh, the increase in competence orientation um, and therefore different uh, office and, and organizations came up with different models um, for global uh, competence models for global learning, for example, the German um, Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, with the curriculum framework on education for sustainable uh, sustainable development. And um, I specifically refer to this one because it also underpinned the questionnaire that I uh, worked out in order to pursue my research question, but more about this in this um, uh, later. First, um, in order to understand um, the, the findings um, of my study, it is important, of course, to know a little bit more about the context of Tanzania, uh, which is why I would like now to briefly outline um, this uh, context of Tanzanian education in general and civic education in particular a little bit more in detail. So um, the Tanzanian uh, education system in general and civic education in particular is still shaped uh, by the post-independence period and the pedagogical concepts of the first president Julius Nyerere and especially his uh, Wiyama ideology and education for self-reliance. Um, these concepts mainly um, uh, include the idea of independence um, of co uh, the colonial past, uh, a focus on the individual's commitment to the total community. That means especially that the right of the individual is not placed above the needs of the community and um, democracy is expressed less in political institutions and processes such as voting, uh, but more in the willingness to work with others and on the basis of equality. Um, on the other hand, um, Looking at the political context of Tanzania, uh, it's important to uh, know that although it is officially a multi-party system, the ruling party dominated since independence. Um, 
also, uh, especially under the uh, recent um, president on uh, Magufuli 2015 to 2021, there was a, uh, there were shrinking civic spaces remarked, especially the Bertelsmann Transformation Index identified Tanzania as sliding from a de facto democracy to a moderate autocracy in this regard. Um, and this is especially important to, of, of course, put uh, the, the responses of the Tanzanian teachers, uh, teachers in, into context. Um, but what is also interesting to know is that according to Afrobarometer 2021, um, not only Tanzanian teachers, but in, in a representative study in the Tanzanian population, 77% um, agreed that democracy is the preferable um, political um, regime type. And, but also that uh, Tanzania is um, a democracy with only minor problems was agreed by half of the population and even 40% um, rem uh, uh, yeah, put uh, or understood uh, Tanzan Tanzanian um, democracy as a full democracy. So uh, coming to the details of the research design, uh, um, as was a larger questionnaire study that was mainly based on uh, the curriculum framework that I just talked about, but also uh, uh, to questions from the um, ICCS that my uh, colleague just talked about before my presentation. Um, the data collection uh, took place uh, between October December, uh, and December 2021 and February and April of this year um, with and was based on the convenience sampling uh, through the network of a German Tanzanian nonprofit organization, which also means that the data um, or the, the study is not a representative study. Um, I uh, collected uh, uh, a total of 61 valid re responses from seven, 17 schools, which are all located in the Kilimanjaro region and in Dar es Salaam. So um, coming to the findings, uh, teachers were asked um, to choose uh, three um, topics that they think are more uh, most uh, put or have the greatest potential for Tanzanian students to learn from German students, but also um, um, in the other direction. Um, this is, of course, not a comprehensive list, and there was also the option to um, add something. So there was also the open an open question, but this was not used by any of the teachers. Um, and I put them here in the order of the most frequent choices for what German students can learn from Tanzanian students, according to the teachers. And what was interesting is that democracy, human rights, gender roles and norms and values are the um, most potential topics for mutual learning, um, according uh, to, to the teachers. And especially because of today's topic, um, I was uh, looking a little bit deeper into what the, do the teachers understand as um, democracy. And here I refer to uh, the question that is based on um, the ICCS, and um, there were different um, different um, situations described, and the responses had to make a choice whether they think it's bad uh, or good for democracy. And um, what is interesting, um, what I would like to point out is that there were most insecurity with regards to the uh, to the question of whether the government's uh, government should uh, be allowed to influence the decisions of the court with regard to, to the meaning or the, the importance of differences in income between rich and poor and with regard to the same rights for different um, racial and ethical groups. Um, about two thirds found that uh, it is bad for democracy that the police has um, uh, the right to um, to hold people suspected of threatening national security in jail without trail, and um, the differences in income between poor and rich um, are small. And one for uh, one quarter found uh, it is bad when racial groups have the same rights. Uh, when the, all different um, uh, racial groups have the same rights. Um, about one, four, uh, one quarter um, was indifferent with regard to differences um, of income and whether people are allowed to protest against unfair laws. Most support for what uh, that um, most of the support was for uh, people should be allowed to criticize the government publicly and that all the adult citizens have the right to elect their political leaders. Uh, when I ask about um, what is a good citizen, um, however, um, I found that uh, voting in every national uh, election is um, is not um, a, 
uh, or not uh, only 60% of the teacher thought that this is very, um, very important. So we see kind of a discrepancy between the de facto practices and um, the understanding of a political regime on a theoretical basis. Um, more generally speaking, the teachers' responses show high ceiling effects, which is why they cannot be interpreted with absolute numbers. But we can see that there are uh, basically three groups of uh, behaviors with different levels of importance. Um, and based on the theoretical framework of the ICCS, uh, they can, uh, we can distinguish between the conventional citizenship uh, behaviors. Um, these are rather in the back of the ranking. Um, those behaviors which relate to social movement related citizenship, um, we found them spread all over the ranking. And um, those finally, those behaviors which are more related to personal responsibility. And here we can see the Tanzanian teachers emphasize these uh, behaviors uh, comparably. Um, although we cannot make any direct comparisons with the ICCS data, um, because this question was only asked to students, um, I tried uh, to make, uh, find at least some, some orientations. Um, and because these uh, schools were all connected to a German partner school, I uh, compared them also with the German data. Um, although here again, Germany uh, didn't participate in the ISS uh, 2016, or at least didn't meet um, the sampling requirements. However, we maybe find some orientations, as I said. So um, on in the IC ICCS 2016 average, the focus was rather on the conventional uh, citizenship behaviors uh, for Germany. However, we found that there was an emphasis rather on the second um, and the third uh, understanding of uh, or uh, types of citizenship uh, behaviors and um, therefore I compared them with the results of the uh, or I compared the section of personal uh, responsible citizenship behaviors with the um, Tanzanian data and here I found uh, however very big differences especially with regard to uh, how important working hard um, and making personal efforts to protect natural resources is um, with regard to uh, to being a good uh, citizen, so this also shows that um, despite there may be some some there's some shared uh, ground for what is understood as a responsible citizen, there are still um, huge differences in the details. Finally, um, according to Kennedy, we can also distinguish between passive and active uh, citizenship behaviors. Um, and here we can see that uh, the Tanzanian teachers um, focused rather on the on the passive um, aspects of, of citizenship, um, which makes sense against the background of the closing or at least limited civic spaces. Um, interestingly, however, especially in comparison to the German students, um, obeying the law um, is most important for German students while learning about the country's history and working hard is rather in the back of um, the ranking. Um, so, um, what can we um, now, how can we conclude and how can we discuss this? Um, so, if we assume that North South school partners have, have a particular potential to pro promote co learn, uh, global learning, can it also promote citizenship education or democracy learning? According to my st study, yes, but uh, with certain limitations. Um, so North South School partnerships are from the perspective of Tanzanian teachers not understood necessarily as a field of civic education. However, there is a shared ground with the interest of democracy learning. Um, but in order to facilitate um, uh, real democracy learning in uh, or mutual learning uh, in North South School partnership, um, there needs to be a, a common understanding of what is democracy and as uh, my findings have shown there might uh, so there's uh, there's reason um, to wonder if there's really a shared understanding if we go into the details and we also see that with regard to the understanding of what is uh, citizenship and the practices of citizenship North South School partnerships need uh, to create spaces to really practice these uh, school, uh, these dem democratic behaviors so thanks very much so going on with our next presentation, or there are um, from Elina Kosistos. Um, she works as a university lecturer in the domain of diversity and inclusive education at the Tampere University in Finland and also in Helsinki University as a docent. Her research interests include teacher ethics and school pedagogy. 
One last publication is Purposeful Learning and Teaching in Finland. Today, she presents a project that she executed together with Inkeri Prisan from Finland, Isolde de Grode and Ingrid Schutte from Netherlands. They all together investigated the civic purpose of pre-service teachers in the Netherlands and in Finland, exploring the question of how teachers can be prepared for democracy teaching and learning in a global horizon. Please, Elina, you have the floor. My name is, uh, I'm Dr. Elina Kuusisto, and I want to give you warm greetings from Tampere and Tampere University. Uh, I'm presenting our paper on civic purpose among higher education students, and this paper has just been published by Journal of Empirical Theology. It is an open access pu publication, so you have access to it easily. The aim of our study is to investigate higher education students' civic purpose. Universities across the world are increasingly interested uh, in the role of advancing students' civic and democratic engagement through research and education. For example, sustainable developmental goals uh, have even made this issue uh, urgent. Still, in the Netherlands and in Finland, where this study uh, is situated, and most other EU countries, few universities or universities of applied sciences have a strong civic mission. What is a civic purpose? Civic purpose is a specific of life purpose. And uh, in William Damon's research group, they have defined it civic purpose as a sustained intention to contribute to the world beyond the self through civic and political action. This definition includes three components. First of all, uh, it includes a civic interest, like a motivational uh, aspect. Secondly, it includes civic activity, so do I, you are actually doing something concretely. And thirdly, uh, it includes a civic identity, which refers to this long-term in, intention. Previous studies show that minority of young people exhibit full civic purpose, indicating that all three dimensions of the civic purpose are present. Instead, majority demonstrate precursor forms of civic purpose with evidence of some, but not all, components. Secondly, previous studies show that civic engagement is associated with worldviews. For example, uh, some young people have stated that uh, civic engagement is a fundamental cornerstone for being religious. And because of this aspect, uh, we were also studying how, what are the student, students' civic purposes and how their worldviews are related to their civic interests. In this particular study, uh, we had two research questions. What kind of civic purpose profiles can be identified among Dutch and Finnish higher education students? And secondly, how are worldviews related to civic purpose profiles? We gathered the data from four institutions, from the Netherlands participated University of Humanistic Studies, which is a small a university, mainly, and all of the students are studying uh, human, humanistic uh, subjects. And this is also an interesting uh, university since it has a worldview uh, basis. It's, uh, 
It's based on humanistic worldview explicitly. Then we had another uh, institution from the Netherlands, Hanse University of Applied Sciences, which is a big institution from northern uh, Netherlands. From Finland, we had also two institutions, Faculty of Education and Culture from Tampere University, and then students from Tampere University of Applied Sciences. And students from applied uh, universities of applied sciences represented uh, many fields of study. The data was gathered with a survey, and the survey included uh, different kind of instruments and open-ended questions. And in this presentation, we are uh, uh, reporting only uh, instruments. Uh, data and analysis based on instruments that measured these three dimensions of civic purpose, motivation, activity, and identity. Few words about the worldviews of the students. Here you can see uh, that uh, at the University of Humanistic Studies, Majority of the students, oh yeah, well, almost 40% of the students did not have any identification with organized worldview. And on the second place was humanism and, and general spirituality. In the Dutch University of Applied Sciences, most of the students, almost 70% uh, of the students uh, did not identify with any organized worldview. In Finland, majority of the students, over almost 50% of the students, identified themselves with Christianity. And on the second place was uh, this uh, no specific uh, identification with the organized worldview. And this phrase uh, quite well int uh, introduces the general situation in, in both countries. But of course, uh, at the University of Humanistic Studies, the number of students representing humanism was a little bit higher. So what kind of civic purpose profiles we were able to identify? Uh, the biggest group was uh, disengaged students who scored slow, low on all three dimensions of civic purpose. And that was the biggest group, 32% of the students. Second largest group was named as, as dreamers. They had some interest, they had some civic identity, but the activities were uh, equally low as for the disengaged students. Then uh, about 20% uh, were called dabblers, since they had, uh, they scored higher, highest in civic activity, but quite low in interest and identity. And then the fourth group was purposeful. 17% of the students scores relatively high on all three dimensions. Our second question was how are worldviews related to civic purpose profiles? And here we are looking at uh, purposeful profile and disengaged profile. In the Netherlands, most of the purposeful students had a, a humanistic or spiritual worldview, or they represented other religions. In the Dutch data, uh, most of the disengaged students did not uh, identify themselves with organized worldview or they had affiliation to Christianity. In Finland, uh, those students who were identified as purposeful were those who represented mostly other religions or humanistic and spiritual worldview. Disengaged students were mostly uh, identifying with no organized worldview or Christianity. So quite close, uh, similar in both countries. 
So what can we conclude based on this uh, study? First of all, most respondents were not engaged at all or very seldom participating in any civic activities, demonstrating mostly precursor forms of civic purpose. However, Dutch students in a humanistic university were civically quite purposeful. In our other studies, uh, their civic interests have also manifested in their personal purposes. And this could be explained with the political dimension of humanism. And since these students are studying in an institution that has a strong value basis, uh, it might have uh, impacted on why they, in the first place, applied to this institution to study, and the studies could also then strengthen their, their ideals. In Finland, religious minorities were civically the most purposeful. And this could be explained with the a, with a idea that there is a greater need for identity work and with uh, those who belong to the religious minorities. And these people are usually also confronted with societal and global issues. Many of the disengaged uh, students did not identify with any organized worldview. And this could be explained with the previous studies that show that spirituality, religiosity, and other worldviews can spur on civic purpose development. And to conclude, the importance of developing civic education in higher education is highlighted in this study. So far, these, uh, for example, the sustainable development and goals are not very well implemented. And in studies, the possibilities to explore concrete options for civic actions, such as experimental learning in civic context, uh, is advised. Thank you so much. And I go on to our next um, to our next presentation, and that will become uh, will come from Emma De Morel. Or a forced, uh, forced contribution. He's a doctoral researcher working on democracy education, global learning and migration at the University of Bamberg in Germany. Supported by Caroline Rau, he presents his research on migrants' understanding of democracy from a world society perspective. This study shows that learning of participation should be thought of transnationally, which in turn challenges the nation, nation state constitution of political education and democracy learning. Please, Emra, you have the floor. Uh, today, I will be presenting about the democracy-centered global societal orientations of German Turks. And my uh, presentation, uh, the structure of my presentation will be as follows. First, I will present the context, uh, state of the research, research desideratum, uh, and research question. Then I will talk about the method, uh, the qualitative reconstructive research approach. Uh, then I will briefly talk about the uh, findings of the study and then the discussions. Uh, the subject of my study is people living in Germany with a background from Turkey. German Turks are by far the largest group of immigrants in Germany. And at the same time, uh, the group on which various problems of migration and integration are focused. This group is inherently complex as it is comprises several ethnic groups. And in my research, I use the term German Turks. Here, Turk or Turkish refers to all individuals who have their family roots in Turkey, regardless of their ethnic and religious identity or their own migration experiences. 
Turkish migration started 60 years ago after German industry was in need of manpower. Uh, they came as guest workers, but their temporary stay turned into permanent. And after 60 years today, there are 2.8 million German Turks living in Germany. This is a multi-layered body. There are several ethnic groups other than Turks, and it is a majority Muslim group with other beliefs. The data on educational situation of German Turks shows that migrants from Turkey more often come from educationally disadvantaged backgrounds other than immigrant groups in Germany. And 25% of German Turks feel disadvantaged in Germany. And there are still young people in the second and the third generations with poor knowledge of German language. And when we look at the studies in global societal learning and democracy related learnings of migrants, studies suggest difficulties in dealing with the global dimension of political understanding and it is embedding in democratic foundations for migrants. Migration experiences are mirrored in the situation of the target country, the recognition and integration of experience there, the educational success, and the political education experiences. Global experiences of migrations do not automatically lead to global social understanding, reflexive thinking, and political, political action but often to isolation tendencies, paternalism, and nationalism for the source country. And there are no research about Turkish migrants, especially in the background of the experiences of the globalization and the orientations to democracy. And the aim of the research is to investigate which global societal orientations include German Turks, how they locate themselves, which learning experiences lead to their democracy understanding, and what experiences do migrants have with participation and dealing with global issues. To find out which orientations German Turks have, a reconstructive, qualitative, and thus hypothesis generating approach was chosen. With the chosen reconstructive approach, it is possibly not only to survey the knowledge stocks reflexively available to persons, but also to reconstruct their implicit action guiding orientations and thus to trace their word society oriented habitus. The research aims to differ the explicit and implicit uh, knowledge of the target group by analyzing the data using the documentary method. The documentary method aims to reach not only the thoughts and the opinions of individuals, but also the social information that forms the basis and directs their actions and focuses not on what the action is, but how it developed. The data of the study was based on theoretical sampling method, and the data for the study was collected through semi-structured narrative interviews, uh, 22 interviews. Uh, within the scope of this study, uh, interviews were analyzed comparatively. This allowed the explication of the implicit or tacit knowledge of the participants. And the comparative analysis enables typifications of findings beyond individual cases. And the commonalities and the constructs are the fundamental principle of generating individual types. By systematic comparisons with other cases, a basic typology is established and confirmed. For validation, interpretations are controlled within an interpretation group who had experience with the method. And we were able to reconstruct six different comparative horizons follows as cultural orientation, spatial orientation, participation, change in time, validity of knowledge, and self-positioning. The condensation of the results led to a basic topology as sociality-related self-efficacy expectation. And then we built four types. For a better understanding of the findings and the types identified, I will now present two cases from the study. Both cases will be within the comparative horizon of participation. The first Interview except is from interview Minnesota. This is a 23 years old woman, a third generation university student. The part reads, we do a lot of intercultural dialogue. So rather on a religious basis, 
now referring to a to the religious track, I am a member, and even in another club, which concerns also rather inter intercultural dialogue. There we do a lot of dialogue work. So we try to explain the Islamic. So in general, the Islamic perspective a little bit here in Germany. In this part of the text, Minnesota is talking about an association where she is volunteering for intercultural and interreligious activities for dialogue with other than Muslims and Turks. A dialogue is a constructive and cooperative exchange of ideas between individuals or groups who hold various religious, spiritual, or ethical convictions. The initiative strives to increase tolerance and acceptance for a more peaceful society by fostering understanding among, amongst various religious religion members. The power of religion is used as a major force for learning about others, making connections with them, and teaching about Islam and Islamic perspective on issues. Religion represents a resource that is especially strong for type two. In the safe and accepted forms of interreligious dialogue, dualities can be bridged and forms of plurality can be felt. Here we see a consensual participation in safe places like mosques and cultural associations and religion as a resource for making bridges with others. Here the type two emerges as bridging duality in the mode of harmonizing dialogue. The second example is from interview uh, Montana. She is a 49 years old second generation woman. You'll never get anything served on the silver tray. You always have to struggle to ma no matter which nationality you have. Whether it's purely German, you have to fight for yourself. I would say now to get your rights. Well, and would them participate? I think that all would be better. So if I then say, see, yes, you, well, I got involved in those things where I thought I want to get that different. And then what do you do? You have to participate. You have to get involved. Here is a proverb. You roll up your sleeves and you do something. In the passage quoted here, Montana tells that reaching a target and achieving a goal, an objective needs working. Otherwise, you will never get anything served on silver tray. To achieve, it is necessary to work and strive to reach the goal. This, this effort needs to uh, stand up to difficulties, even with hard struggles. Otherwise, it will not be possible to achieve the desired and expected result. Participation, or in general, an action is the most basic way to reach the desired point. Without being involved, it is not possible to get a result. You roll up your sleeves and you do something. No one works for anybody as needed, and no right comes on a silver plate. The orientation is documented as to achieve something, hard work and participation are needed. And discursivity is one of the fundamental forms of democratic participation. Democracy requires participation in the formation of ideas, which depends on people discussing other uh, together looking for the best option in a debate and seeking compromises together. The basis for this is an orientation towards discursivity where positions are exchanged and weighed through communication. The participation comparative horizon emerges as civic engagement shaped in the interest groups and based on the understanding of human rights. And the type four can be formulated as uh, social self-assignment in the mode of discursivity. When we come to the findings of the study, uh, all those surveyed have an idea of participation, but these understandings are very different. For the first example, participation is characterized by transferring oneself or one's own values to others. Whereas for the second example, participation is characterized by an understanding that supports any person, even if it is a matter that concerns only oneself. And not every orientation on the topic of participation is functional for the requirements of a functionally differentiated society. 
Although participation often manifested in a positive way, the study found that not all types of participation are functional for a democratic society. Because of time constraints, I couldn't bring them here, but for example, for type one, participation took the form of imposing one's own ideas on others, and it has a negative attitude towards diversity. These orientations are independent of educational background and migration history. The study found that education and migration background had very limited, and in many cases, almost no impact on the orientations. It was not possible to establish a direct relationship between education level and support for authoritarianism or democracy. Rather, they are linked to perception of the plurality of the society of origin, in our case, Turkey. One of the main results of the study is that the understanding of democracy, how pluralism is seen and accepted in the country of origin is as important as even more important than the country of residence in the perception of democracy. Uh, the perception of plurality, understanding accepting, uh, accepting uh, differences and to develop a better democracy, it is necessary to learn and teach on what pluralism is and how it should be understood. It is important to recognize that migrant groups have may have differences within itself. Within the German Turks, the perception of different groups towards each other can sometimes lead to conflicts that go beyond the boundaries of an intellectual disagreement. And hybridity of cultures, the differences in space resulting from the so-called non-German and non-Turkishness leads to negative combinations. It turns out that hybrid intercultural or non-nationally bound identities are not trans transformed into a positive form. Educational offers with topics such as plurality in Turkey, hybrid identities in the face of global and cultural heterogenization processes should be given more attention and search movements should be gone through in which the hybrid character of the respective identity is dimensioned. And global uh, learning social justice relationship, conscious learning of self excitement competence is also, this is also recognizable that lived cosmopolitanism is related to a sense of social recognition. Social recognition is associated with a symbolic state form of recognition, while the social significance of the civic side of the engagement is underestimated. And what are, uh, since this is an educational platform, I will limit my points with the educational uh, parts and what are the educational offers that can be applied in different settings. It would be significant for educational work to strengthen the civic society dimensions. Political education should not be reduced to institutional studies and an understanding of the electoral processes but should make civil society a tangible uh, experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Now I'd like to very briefly introduce our discussant uh, for this uh, webinar. That's Professor Annette Dr. Dr. H.C. Scheunflug from Bamberg University. She holds there the Chair of Foundation in Education. Her research interest Interests have a long focused on global learning, social justice, and quality development of education systems in sub-Saharan countries. She has been chair of the board of the Global Education Network of Europe since 2019, and still is, and we are very delighted that you will now be contributing to this webinar as discussant. Please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And because we have such an discussing friendly audience, I try to be short. So the reflection today is about the contribution of global learning as a possible contribution for democracy. And the relevance of this topic is discussed. So we have today four studies with one concern. What is the relation between global learning and learning about democracy? And the relevance is, of course, given as democracies are under pressure. And we see that 
the two aspects of democracy being a representative system on the one hand side and being a deliberative system as an accommodative way of life, as Habermas is saying is, they are both under pressure because many decisions today are not longer being made at a nation level. And by this, a lot of some citizens compensate this perception by and this experience, uh, they think this is a weakness and they want to be strong. They want to have strong governments. And by this, they vote then for um, parties which are minimizing complexity in their positions. So democracies are coming under pressure. And the hypothesis of this symposium was that global education is a way and a contribution for democracy, democracy in this in this way, in this perceptions. So we had had several findings. First, the findings of Jana that there are problems in the international assessment of global learning. I mean, this PISA assessment has a lot of problems, but one is that this is very much focusing on intercultural learning and by this disregarding the dimension of global social, social justice and of course, by this as well, not very much um, fostering the understanding of the contribution of global learning to the field of democracy and to the field of a local understanding of what justice means. Second, we had the contribution of Louise, where it was very obvious that expectations in global partnerships are related to democracy learning and that there is potential there. And we have seen as well that there are some shared grounds, but of course, differences in details. And of course, if you have differences, discourse about the differences is always very interesting and bringing things forward. Elena was reflecting about civic motivation, civic activity, and civic identity, and the way how these three aspects are connected. And I mean, we, we should discuss whether having about 20% of students having a, a high engagement in this field is high or not high. Elena was saying it's not enough. And she has pointed out a big need for more civic ed education in the field of higher education. And the contribution of Emma and Caroline was about the participation desires of migrants and the plurality perceptions of and the importance of plurality perceptions and the ability of self-assignment competences. And all these aspects, of course, contribute to the understanding of deliberative democracy on the one hand side, and on the other hand side, they are fostered, or there is the hypothesis that they are fostered by global learning. So by this, I would like to summarize and to discuss with you that global learning has a very big potential for learning about deliberative democracy by deepening the understanding of the global society, by going beyond interculturality and by focusing on important world questions as climate and justice, by offering possibilities of participation and empowering for self-assignment for participation, and by linking motivation, action, and identity. And of course, by offering possibilities of encounters and mutual learning. And of course, from this point of view, more research is needed on the relation between democratic values and global values, on the conditions how to learn this, and on its relation for acting in democracies. But in the field where democracy education is getting more and more important, global learning, by this finding, from my understanding, can really contribute and can be loud, outspoken, can be outspoken on contributing to the field. So thank you very much. This has been my short contribution to the discussion.
Yes, I'd just like to say a few words to thank all, all the speakers for a really interesting afternoon's discussion. And I think one of the things I find really interesting from the conversations today was the ways in which what, what appeared to be quite different presentations in terms of themes, how they came together under some common agenda about making the connection between global learning and democracy. And I think one of the things I found from my own experience is that the question of democracy is always there in the background in lots of our conversations, discussions, but is not sufficiently brought to the foreground. And I think in the light of some of the conversations, particularly in the chat and thinking about the, a couple of the last points, the current political context within which we're living both in Europe and beyond Europe um, is raising some very interesting challenges for us at the moment. And I think um, one's only got to look at a recent um, uh, political development in the Latin American country to see the, the potential dangers there are to some of the things that we feel is very important to the promotion of our work. So I'd like to, to thank all, all the presenters for their contribution and to well, thank you all for participating and for ensuring that what we ha had was a very in enriching and positive conversation. And you will see in the chat that we have an event coming up on the 13th of December and we have a number of events uh, in, the, in the new year. And so please keep in touch with our ANGEL website and our current activities and look forward to seeing you all again soon. And thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.